Please take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5, in your Bibles this morning. And let me mention, first of all, if you haven't heard already, that it is our intention, uh, Lord willing, next Sunday for us to resume our regular schedule of corporate services. We will not be having Sunday school, children's church, and uh, there's some other adjustments, but uh, we will be meeting together, Lord willing, at 11 o'clock next Sunday morning for our corporate service, as well as uh, 6 p.m. Sunday evening and then Wednesday night, and we'll continue to communicate with the church family, but just wanted you to be alert to that. If you haven't received correspondence from us, then uh, let us know. We'll make sure we can get that to you. I also have to say something about this morning's message, and uh, this will likely clear up a mystery for some of you. Um, I spent uh, the week after Easter working on the eighth and final beatitude. If you've been with us over the course of uh, the last couple of months, you may know that our, our last two messages in particular were occupied with the beatitude that is found here in verses 10 through 12. And as I was preparing, I uh, sent Samuel a note earlier in that week and, uh, as, and told him that I was preparing to preach on being persecuted for righteousness sake this week. And then the following week, I would be uh, working on persecuted for his name's sake. Uh, I tried to give him a little idea of the thrust so that he could help with preparing the service order. And then on Saturday morning, as I was putting in some additional study, uh, I uh, came to realize to my own humiliating amazement um, and it's really hard to explain everything else uh, that went into my mind that I had had a massive blunder. And that blunder was that I had never preached on verse 9 and the seventh of the Beatitudes. Um, all I can say is before Palm Sunday um, and then Easter and that break, I had started working on Blessed Are the Peacemakers, Somehow after Easter, I thought that I had actually preached that message, and I just went on to the next beatitude. And uh, when I realized what uh, had happened, I went back to my notes. I thought maybe here at the last second I could switch, but, but I had just come to the conclusion that that probably was not going to work at this point, and just determined to trust the Lord that this is what he wanted, uh, that he wanted to use my blunder, and I hoped that no one would, um, uh, would at least temporarily notice. So I had just reached that conclusion when I got a text from Samuel saying, Dad, didn't you skip over Blessed Are the Peacemakers? So at that point I knew, um, <clears throat> well, at least he was going to notice, and likely others of you have noticed, and... Uh, the mystery uh, just can only be explained by my blunder, and um, I don't, I don't want to actually suggest another label for uh, what, what was wrong with my intellect and uh, that whole process, so we'll just leave it at blunder, uh, but that is what happened, and, and we want to go back. We certainly have no, uh, no reason to skip over on purpose the seventh beatitude, and we want to give our attention to this one this morning in verse number 9 of Matthew 5. If you follow along as I read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. They shall be called the, the children of God. About two weeks ago, one of our relatives sent us a pile of pictures I uh, went all the way back in a couple cases to my senior year of high school. Then there was a couple of Karen and I dating, uh, even in the early days. But then a bulk of the pictures were uh, when the kids were little. And one of the big topics of conversation, of course, was going back and seeing whose face had changed from what they were then, what they are now. But, but one of them was about, you know, who most look like mom or dad at various stages. In fact, you could see my senior year of high school and who most looked like dad when 
dad was a senior in high school, and then who looked like mom and dad when they were dating, and, and, um, and what kids when they were younger looked more like dad's side or mom's side. Then you know that one of the first topics of conversation when uh, newborns uh, are seen, when their face is seen for the first time is what side does that newborn favor? Do they, does that one favor mom or dad? And sometimes as the, as the next uh, few months, as the child grows, sometimes they, they actually kind of change features a little bit so that you said, whoa, when they were first born, I thought they were all dad, and now I'm seeing more of mom. And, and that, all of that kind of conversation you're familiar with, the, the most significant connections, of course, are to personality traits. Um, over time, um, someone responds a certain way to, to some circumstance, and, and somebody says he is definitely his father's son. Or maybe the, they will say something like, you are so much like your mom. And they may say it positively, like, you are so much like your mom. Or they may say it like, you are so much like your mom. <clears throat> Whatever it is, people are, are catching. It might be a compliment. It might not be so flattering. But, but we're familiar with the connections and the concept. And the scripture indicates that you can know something of the true spiritual condition of a man by who he resembles. John chapter 8, you don't need to turn, verse 44, Jesus said of some men, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, uh, he writes, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Then what John is, is saying is by, by these qualities that are under discussion, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. God's children can be known by actions and attitudes that are consistent with the character of God. God's children give evidence that they have spent a lot of time with God that they have listened to him at such length that, that not only have they purposefully responded to instructions, but they have just spent time in his presence, and the time in his presence has shaped who they are. And our text this morning tells us, again, of one of the distinctive character traits of a child of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, that's the trait, and look again, for they shall be called the children of God. This, this quality referred to here as peacemaking is something that reflects God. It reveals when it's in somebody's life, it reveals that someone has spent a great deal of time in fellowship with God. Now, because some people hear the word uh, peacemaking and they think, of, they think more of the concept of peaceful or, or easygoing or mild-mannered, um, I do feel as if we should make some clarifications right up front. Okay, the Bible does indicate that there is such a thing, and one man wrote and commentating on this, he he wrote that the Bible speaks of a holy, righteous, God-ordained violence. Now, that certainly is provocative, and it's extreme, but even cited for support, a passage is like, because the iniquity of the Amorites was full, God called on his people to drive out and snuff out the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Centuries later, when God's own people sinned at great lengths, generation after generation, he used the attack and the conquering of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. And in Jeremiah chapter 51, it even describes using Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon as a club against his own people. And you, of course, move into the New Testament. Romans chapter 13 tells us that civil government is God's minister, minister of God, and then it says, and he does not bear the sword in vain. 
And the book of Revelation points to a time when God will deal with this God-defying world in wrath. So it is important that we uh, not begin with the wrong idea that, that God's high regard for peacemaking somehow eliminates taking aggressive, uh, what, we might even, what we might even call severe actions. And I think it's also important to clarify that God's valuing um, peacemaking in his children does not mean that a Christian um, in the will of God will live a life absent of conflict. All right, several years ago, I attempted to discover all the passages um, in which the scripture speaks of the Christian life in terms of a warfare. I was really kind of studying the, the broader concept of spiritual warfare. And I found at that time uh, 40 passages and then dozens of other individual uh, expressions that refer to battles in the Christian life. I mean, some of these are very familiar to us. Paul told Timothy to fight the good fight. Uh, he urged him to war a good warfare. And I could go on. So, so whatever peacemaking is, again, it doesn't preclude uh, what we might think of as confrontation and contending and aggressive actions and mindsets, and it doesn't eliminate... Um, those realities even within the true Christian experience. But with those clarifications in mind, I do want to point out as we start with God, that when God deals with men in wrath, he describes it, even about himself, he describes it as his strange work. You don't need to turn because I'm just dropping in, but Isaiah 28 and verse 21. The Lord shall rise up in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. So, so the Bible is saying, and uh, it is describing God as being moved with wrath and being moved to destruction and then says repeatedly, that is his strange work. That is, it is strange in that it's alien to his prevailing posture and, and, and to his greatest desire. At times, God must act in wrath to bring about righteousness. But we need to remember even about God that that is, as, as he's described, strange. That is alien to his prevailing posture. What the Bible tells us again and again is that God's primary posture towards man is kindness and tenderness. Before we get out of this chapter, Matthew chapter 5, in this same Sermon on the Mount, down in verse number 44, if you want, you could just look over there. He said, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Notice the same connection, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. And all this kindness and tenderness uh, flows out of his love. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And one expression of, of his loving posture, his kind, gentle posture towards man is that he pursues a relationship of peace. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20 just refers to him as the God of peace and even of the great shepherd of the sheep. And because God is a God of peace, he sent his son, 
According to the prophet Isaiah in, in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, his son is the prince of peace. God sent a messenger to prepare the way for his son. And, and Luke chapter 1 and verse 79 proclaims that one of the roles of John the Baptist would be to guide feet into the way of peace. Jesus, before the crucifixion, told his closest disciples that in the world they would have tribulation, but according to John 14 and verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And the rest of the New Testament just continues to communicate this same theme prominently. Uh, the term peace is found around a hundred times. Every one of Paul's 13 epistles opens with his expressing a desire and prayer that grace and peace from God be upon and be the experience of his readers. So God's prevailing posture towards men is a pursuit of peace and when a man has been with God, again, this is a character trait that is increasingly noted in his own life. And with that in mind, we want to try to narrow our focus a bit and, and explore what peacemaking is. Blessed are the peacemakers. What would that be? Well, we've reminded ourselves previously that the audience that the Lord uh, that was listening to the Lord that day was primarily Jewish, if not exclusively Jewish people. And the Hebrew word that those people would have associated with peace is a word Jewish people are still using today. In fact, I actually heard it on a news broadcast this week. Uh, was one man speaking to someone of Jewish background and actually use the word shalom. That, that term is found over 250 times in the Old Testament scripture. And for the sake of our understanding, it is important to note that it is translated with a variety of English words. And, and please, I, I hope I don't lose you here, and you just kind of check out because you think I'm just kind of you know, being comprehensive so that we have a, a you know, complete lesson. I'm, what I'm saying now is because every uh, in-depth study of this word that I consulted warned of not letting our English concept limit our understanding more narrow than, than what it would have been in this day. If I were to ask you to define peace, I think you would probably go in the direction of our English dictionaries. And one of, one of the dictionaries I looked at gave these entries. It said the normal non-warring condition of a nation or group of nations. Um, a second one was an agreement or treaty between warring and antagonistic nations and groups and so on to end hostilities. Another one was a state of mutual harmony between people or groups, especially in personal relations, that would be peace, or cessation or freedom from any strife or dissension. So you can see internationally or start to talk about something, uh, you know, more local or maybe even just between individuals. There, there's, there's freedom from strife or dissension, all right? Those are English definitions in our dictionary, and, and those definitions aren't misguided. The Bible will use the term that way. The issue would be if we only limit it to those concepts. The, the idea of freedom from war or absence of hostility on, on some level, it's just that that is insufficient for the fullness of the term. Listen to how the term is translated. It's translated in our Bibles with the expression ease, health, 
prosperity, safety, well-being, and welfare. All right, so you can see that it certainly can refer to a situation of no conflict, but with those expressions, you can see that it is much more than that. If you were talking about relationships, for instance, you're talking about health and safety and well-being. You're, you're talking about relationships, again, that are healthy, that are stable. And if, if I think of a big picture illustration, I could ask you, is the nation of Israel at peace today? Well, I'm not aware of any presently open wars involving Israel. But if I followed that up and said, would you say that their relationships, the relationship between Israel and its neighboring uh, you know, Muslim countries is one of relational health and stability? Well, the answer to that is no, because there is even currently right now conflict that's being discussed and it's been overshadowed by the whole virus thing about, about Israel's annexing certain points of the West Bank. And, and just getting into that discussion, again, you start to realize that, that the relationships are not healthy and stable. The psalmist in Psalm 122 said to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. Peace and prosperity, those are concepts that, that went together in the Old Testament. And let's just turn over to Psalm 128. And th this one reference isn't going to be comprehensive, but you get a little more idea of, of how the term is used, Psalm 128, and uh, we'll just start reading in, in verse 1 and read right down through this, this entire psalm. Notice Psalm 128, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. Happy shalt thou be, it shall be well with thee, thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and, what's the next word? And peace upon Israel. So all that's come before, <coughs> your, 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 just your blessedness, your safety and security in the land, uh, the fruitfulness of your fields, the wonderful relationship with your wife and your children and so on, all of that is what, is what the Jews would have referred to. And honestly, they still refer to when they meet each other on the streets today and say, Shalom. This is what they are desiring for one another. If I talk about the term as a whole, if you could describe what you uh, would want in this life and in eternity, you would describe it by this term. This is actually what Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. And this is what we all lost on account of sin. But brethren, this is what God still wants us to have and is and has provided for and is preparing for us. What would it be like to promote this? This, this shalom, this peacemaking. What would it be to move into action to make this kind of peace. Well, turn 
first of all, to Colossians chapter 1. What has God done in his own role of, of being a peacemaker? Colossians chapter 1, and uh, look down at verse number 19. And we'll read down through verse 22. Notice, for it pleased the Father that in him, referring to Christ, should all fullness dwell so that verse 20 having made here's our concept having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile that is part that's where we even started by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him i say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. What God has done to make provision for peace is he sent his son fully god but completely taking on <coughs> human flesh so that he might <coughs> go to the cross and make provision first of all for our reconciliation with god but then to also make provision so that we be holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight no longer alienated reconciled and have this life that god has provided for through jesus christ and then turn back to ephesians chapter 2 what else has god done even through christ making provision for peace being a peacemaker well notice uh, i'm sorry ephesians chapter 2 and and this work of christ that brings peace with god also has an impact on the relationships between brethren in christ notice ephesians 2 verse 14 for he is our peace who hath made both one and now the parties under discussion are jew and gentile who formerly were at enmity but in christ have been have been made one that is believers in christ and notice and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making what? So making peace, and just skip down verse number 18 and 19, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you can see there that the work of Christ not only is provided for reconciliation with God and all the blessings, all the riches that we have in Christ, but it is also made provision so that people that were one time positioned against each other can now live for the well-being of one another as they fellowship and labor together in the body of christ god's made provision through christ for our well-being in terms of our relationship with him and he's made provision in christ for our mutual edification and the pursuit of well-being amongst one another in the body of christ that is his peacemaking and in terms of the impact that that ought to have even on our own lives go over to james chapter 3 and now i'm taking a significant step forward in terms of <coughs> of application to us and even what peacemaking would look like on our parts in relationships notice james chapter 3 and verse number 14 
says, if ye have better envying, and I have to pause, I won't spend as long time as I, as I probably should, and Lord willing can come back to another time, but better is from the whole background, of the, the whole concept of herbs. And you would describe you would describe an herb as bitter to the taste because it was harsh. We, we'd sometimes say it, that, that it's got a harsh taste about it. And we could pursue the word further, but in this context, it's really talking about the, the idea of, of envy in other places, the same concept as zeal, that, that you, you could have a harsh zeal. And notice coupled with this is the particular issue strife in your hearts and that is a word that comes out of the whole realm of of campaigning like you think of as political campaigning or the concept of in particular getting out the vote for me All right so so you have there there's 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 this harsh zeal because you are promoting a campaign um that that is to get you know, to get votes, that is to get everybody to see it your way, your cause, your agenda. And he says, if you have this kind of, <clears throat> of bitter envying and this kind of striving in your hearts, look, glory not, lie not against the truth, this, and if we had, if they use quotes, this would be where it would be. This quote-unquote wisdom, this so-called wisdom, all right, <clears throat> this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. That is, this so-called wisdom is not God's wisdom. The way you're operating is not with God's wisdom. It, it, it could just be flat-out earthly wisdom, human wisdom. It could be fleshly, the idea of uh, you know, operating out of our depraved nature, or the devil could, behind, could be behind it, devilish. Earthly, sensual, devilish. It doesn't have to be all of the above. But, but whatever it is, it's not of God. Because, look at verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is, notice this, there is confusion and every evil work. You could be thinking that your campaign is even a campaign of righteousness, but being promoted with the bitter envying, with this harsh zeal and a campaigning spirit, you may actually be doing more harm than good. I'm in the passage is saying that. Verse 17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. So again, we're, we're back to making sure we don't misinterpret and take this outside of boundaries. It doesn't compromise integrity, honor, purity, truth. It is that. It's first. But then notice how all of that is promoted and even the stand is taken. Then peaceable, gentle, it would, it would be glad for peace. If peace could come, it would be glad for that. And, and it's seen by carrying out and gentle and easy to be entreated, can be appealed to, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. <clears throat> and what does all this have to do with peace? Look at verse 18. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Look, well, compare again the environment and outcomes of verse 16 and verse 18. Verse 16, where envy and strife is, confusion and every evil work. Verse 18, the fruit of righteousness sown in peace of them that make peace. Wisdom says, be careful. Be careful, be careful about constant striving and envy and the passions and the campaigning spirit about that <clears throat> because you might end up actually provoking evil. Wisdom says, 
Righteousness that you want to see is often sown in peace of those that are really working to make peace. Now, brethren, what is your influence and contribution to your relationship spheres? What is your, your contribution in your church? Are you operating with wisdom in your home? You might be right. Are you operating with wisdom that recognizes very often the fruit of righteousness is going to be in the context of, of pursuing peace and, and well-being, gentle and easy and so on. People that have experienced the God of peace and his gospel and by grace are growing to be more and more like him, they will not, as a general rule, be known for being a problem causer, an instigator, but they will be known as a, a, as a problem solver. Now, again, this is one of those arenas that just so burdened to come back in and make sure it's boundaried in. There, there is a peace that is traitorous to accept. There, there are even people within a church that cause problems by the peace they make with the wrong people or the wrong cause at the wrong time. I mean, and the Bible is, is abundant in those kind of um, illustrations. First Corinthians chapter 5, a whole church had made peace with an immoral church member. That's a traitorous peace. Pursuit of a certain kind of peace only produces more trouble later. That's even down to uh, the rubber meets the road in a home. When a parent won't, won't take the time to deal with hard issues with a child because they value a present feeling of, of you know, friendship, of acceptance with and by the child, when they won't deal with hard issues in a child's life because they want that feeling of current peace, they're actually just kicking the problem down the road. And will experience much more trouble later down the road. And anything to avoid, uh, to avoid trouble mindset is, is actually going to reap a whirlwind of trouble. One man wrote, these easygoing, peace-at-any-price people are often lacking in a sense of justice and righteousness. They do not stand where they should stand. They're flabby. They appear to be nice. But if the whole world were run on such principles and by such people, it would be even worse than it is today. All right, all of that is true. However, with all of that said, we have to assert that a true peacemaker is not a quarrelsome, troublemaking person. You cannot be full of envy and jealousy and be a peacemaker. But brethren, you, you also cannot be just ultra-sensitive and touchy and always on the defensive and, and, and always reacting to every little thing and be a peacemaker. A peacemaker is one that is not looking at everything in terms of what effect does it have upon me? How will people react to me? What is this going to mean to me? Getting hurt and offended and whatever else when my idea gets um is, isn't the one that holds sway a, a peacemaker just isn't even thinking of those things they're not at the forefront of the peacemaker's mind they're not there because this one has been transformed by the grace of god 
and has an entirely different view of himself. He's seen himself, if I even just go back to those Beatitudes again, he has seen himself impoverished in his spirit and grieved his sinfulness and become meek before God and recognizes he must have God give him righteousness and do that work in his life. He has a different view of God and a different view of others as well because he's seen himself in the sight of God. And because of the mercy of God to him in Christ, he looks and he acts towards others with tender compassion. He's merciful. He longs to be pure in heart and he seeks to live for the glory of God and the good of others. His interest is all about the well-being of others and the advancement of the work of God. In practice, peacemaking will often mean that we learn to just hold our tongue. And the whole first part of James chapter 3 is about that and then leads into this uh, last section that we just looked at. James said if we would learn to control our tongues, there would be a whole lot less trouble in our world. Sometimes peacemaking means that we actually just suffer wrongs and injustice against ourselves for the sake of the good of the whole and other individuals. What it really means is that we think through any and every situation in light of the advancement of the gospel. What are the full implications of what I'm about to do? I'm not the only one that's going to be affected. What about the cause of Christ? What about the mission of the church? What about a lost and dying world? And, and peacemaking means that I'm thinking about those things. And, and it also means that I, that I look for ways and means to promote the well-being of others. It does mean I have an evangelistic mindset and engage in evangelistic endeavors. That I, I realize that people have war and conflict and messes in their lives because of their sin and what they really need is Christ and the gospel, the gospel that brings peace. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It means that we look for other means as well to relieve needs and express kindness and sympathy and, and sometimes just downright wholesome cheer that we look for ways to bring that to people's lives. It could mean that, again, we see a life that is consumed with the, with the poison of fleshliness and worldliness, and, and, and we get aggressive even, and we seek to see that disease treated with the Scripture. If you think that, that wrestling with all of this, you know, even the, the constant putting the, the boundaries on, okay, here's here's what peacemaking is not but here's what peacemaking is and it's not just about having the right cause but going about it the right way and and if you think that wrestling with all of this is not really that big of a deal brethren think again of christ who humbled himself who took on the form of a man and the servant of men and ultimately died the death of the cross, was lifted up with shame on the cross. Think of him who, do it, who did that for the sake of your peace and mine. Listen, war and fighting and contention, that is not strange to men. James says it comes even of our lusts, that war in our members. That's natural for us. But God is something entirely different at the core of his person and one mark that we've been with him and are becoming more like him is this quality of peacemaking that we are really in pursuit of the well-being of others and the advancement of the gospel for their ultimate well-being blessed are the peacemakers 
For they are the children of God. They are really starting to look like their Father who is in heaven. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we just find that there is so much here for our minds um, to really give attention to. We, we sense in our world that is in rebellion against you that more and more even on kind of a worldwide scale the, the kings of the earth, the psalmist said, have taken counsel together against you and your anointed one and we, we sense the world on, on just an international scale um, combining together to shake their fist against you and, and, and we sense that kind of tension we know it's ramifications right down to our own culture. Lord, we see in many cases uh, believing people, circles of our own fellowship in, in past years and contacts and friends and brethren that we've ministered with in the past. And, and uh, we see another generation that, that seems to be so capitulating under the pressure we sense in our day the need to earnestly contend for the faith, to fight the good fight, to endure hardness as a good soldier. We recognize all those things are there, but Lord, we, while we need your grace and strength to endure and to stand in the fight, we are in desperate need also of the time spent with you to be reflected in a certain graciousness and peaceableness and gentleness and meekness and easy to be entreated and and lord we we need your help so that we even where we've stood perhaps rightfully stood that that, that the standing doesn't end up being about us at some point and our winning but that our standing continues to be about the well-being of others and the advancement of the gospel. And Lord, all the way down into relationships and marriages and with our children and in our church, Lord, we pray that increasingly we would, we would know the likeness to you, to your son in all of these ways. We thank you that united to you, uh, there is uh, the provision of Christ and there is the very real work of the Spirit. And Lord, we, we thank you that as they take your word and the Spirit uses it, we can be transformed, we can be changed. And so we anticipate that, but Lord, we pray that you would just mercifully work in our lives in this way. And may Christ be seen and known and may others come to know him as, as we are transformed into his very image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Now may the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.